Good morning, Lighthouse. Company is coming. Have you experienced the thrill of house guests? What needs to be done to get a home ready? Turn on some lights. Practice hospitality. Advent is a time of preparation, celebrating the arrival of Jesus as a baby in our midst and looking forward to his return as the soon and coming king. This year we celebrate, we, I'm sorry, this year we center our thoughts on Hebrews 13, chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. On this first Sunday of event, we light the candle of hope. The prophet Isaiah announced, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. A simple act of hospitality is to leave a light on, a candle in the window, a lamp by the door, a light in the bedroom, a night light in the hall. Illumination guides the eyes and steps, showing the way to move forward, a glimmer of hope in times of darkness. Where is it deeply dark in our world today? Who is behind bars of shame or addiction? Who is stuck in the darkness of debt? or despair? Is someone lonely or afraid, discouraged or grieving? Left out or overlooked? Who feels hopeless, confused, and in the dark? Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. In him was life, and the light was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. For it is God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You who believe in Jesus are the light of the world. The light of hope is in you. This Advent season, let us be light bearers as we center as as we entertain strangers in our midst shine light in dark places punch holes in the darkness offer the hope of jesus let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father in heaven we, we give, give glory, glory to god for hope, hope. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank God for Advent season. Amen. We're going to uh, sing this song. How many know, how many in here can say that God made a way for you? I, he made a way for me, for sure. For sure. Amen. Amen. made a way don't know how but you did it he made a way standing here not knowing how we'll get through this test but holding on to faith you know best Nothing can catch you by surprise. You've got this figured out and you're watching us now. But when it looks as if we can't win, you wrap us in your arms and stepped in. And everything we need you supply. You've got this in control. And now we know that you, you made a way. 
When our backs were against the wall And it looks as if it was over You, you made a way And we're standing here Only because you made a way Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. You've made a way. Jesus. Now we're here. Looking back on where we come from. Thank you, God. Because of you and nothing we've done. To deserve the love and mercy you've shown. But your grace was strong enough to pick us up. And you, you've made a way. When our backs were, when our backs were against and it looks as, and it looked as if it was God, you made a way. You made a way. And we're standing here, and we're standing here, only because, only because you made, you a, made way. a way, you, you made a when way. When our backs were, when our backs were against the and wall, and it looked as, and it looked as if it was God, you made a way, you, you made a way. And we're standing here, and we're standing here, only because, only because you made a way. way. And you move mountains, you cause walls to fall with your power. You perform miracles, there is nothing. That's impossible, and we're standing here only because you made and you move mountains, you cause walls to fall with your power, you perform miracles. There is nothing that's impossible, and we're standing here. Only because, Only because you made move mountains, you cause walls to fall with your power, perform miracles. There is nothing that's impossible, and we're standing here. Only because, Only because you made And we're standing, and we're standing here. here Only because, Only because you made And we're standing here Only because you made a way You, you made a way You made a way You, you made a way Out of no way you made a you, way, you made a way. He'll provide for you, so he made you, a way. You made a way. I don't know how, but you didn't. You, you made, made a way. I don't know how, but you didn't. You made a way. I don't know how, but you didn't. I don't know how, but I'm grateful. I don't know how, but I'm grateful. Don't know why, 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 but I'm grateful. And we're standing here. Only because you made a way. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yay, God. Thank you, Lord. Yay, God. He made a way. He made a way. Don't know how, but he did it. Don't know how. It's not even my job to know how. All I know is that he did it. Father, we just want to say thank you today because you made a way. You made a way when there was no way. 
You made a way when there didn't seem to be a way. You made a way when they said there couldn't be a way made. You made a way. And Lord, we are grateful today. We are indeed grateful. Our hearts are overwhelmed because our God made a way. We just want to say thank you today. We just want to honor you, Lord, with the fruit of our lips, God. We just want to let you know that we love you today and we worship you today and we honor you today. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in this room today. We thank you, Lord, for, for your presence just being in your people today, God. We thank you for the anointing in the place today, Father. And we bless you for what you have done and for what you have yet to do. We ask, Lord, that you would just continue to make ways. Continue, Lord, to open doors and move mountains, God. Continue to just be our God. We thank you. We praise you. We glorify you now in Jesus' name. Come on, give God some praise today in his house. Amen. Amen. He is worthy. He is worthy. And we ought to praise him. Don't ever get tired of praising the Lord because he never gets tired of taking care of you, to taking care of our needs, making sure we have everything that we need. So we ought never get tired of praising him. Amen? Amen. Give him some more praise. Come on now. Y'all kind of quiet today. Give him some more praise. Lift him up. Bless his name because he's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Yes, God. We bless your name, God. We bless him. We bless him. I thank God for the beginning of Advent season. Um, on the video, when it was my turn and we, I, you know, we, we had some technical issues, but we made the best of the video. So I praise God for that. I think it was a good video. But at the, when it was my turn, I was saying on there that this is my favorite time of year. If you know me, you know that I love, I call it Christmas, Advent, just whatever you want to call it. It's all in there together. I love it because it's the time of year that the Spirit of the Lord seems to just rest upon people more. People seem to be a little more kind. They seem to be a, a little bit easier to get along with. It just it's just an exciting time for me. I love giving gifts. I always tell people I love giving them. I love getting them, too. I'm just going to be honest with you. And I'm just like a big old kid at Christmas time. I, I just enjoy it. But I mostly, the, the biggest thing I enjoy about Christmas is because we get to talk more about Jesus. And we get to tell folks why we're smiling. We get to talk about this great Savior who came wrapped up in, as the scriptures say, in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. It's just his time. And I love it. So, hey, bring it on. Amen? Yeah. Amen. It's time for the word, and we're going to get to it now. I'm going to ask that you would stand with me as we read today, and you would grab your Bibles. It's the book of Luke, chapter 2. Luke, chapter 2. And it will be on the screen. Chapter 2, and I'm, got, I'm, it's, I'm taking the text from chapter, um, excuse me, chapter 2, verses 25 through 38, but I'm not going to read... All, I'm going to read 25 through 32, and then I'm going to pick up again at 36. But when you go home, you read the whole story. Take your time and read it and ask God to speak to you through it. So let's, let's read. It's from, we're coming from the New Living Translation. It says, at that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, which is, <clears throat> which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. And then if you go down to verse 36, it says, Anna, a prophet, was there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple but stayed there day and night worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue 
Jerusalem. You may be seated and we bless God for his word this morning. As I said, today begins the Advent season and many of us, I can't say everybody, but many of us are excited about this season. We're no longer looking for the initial coming because the word Advent means the, the waiting, the looking forward to. And, be, and we're not looking for the initial coming, but we celebrate the coming. We celebrate the fact that our God was true to the promise he made to his people, a promise which had been foretold hundreds of years before. If you go back to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, it tells us, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace, and of his reign there shall be no end. That was the Jesus that the scripture was talking about, this Jesus that the people were waiting for. So each week from today until our Christmas morning service, and for those of you who hadn't realized it, yes, Christmas this year falls on Sunday. So on, on from this day to Christmas morning, we're going to take time to celebrate what each of the Advent candles represent. And this week we be, begin with the candle of hope. And so this series that we, we're starting today is called the Candles of Advent. And so today, again, we begin with the candle of hope. We hear the word hope a lot, but my question is, do we really know what it means? Do we really understand what it means? According to Webster's Dictionary, it says, hope means to expect with confidence, to desire with expectation of obtainment. It's an expectation of the fulfillment desired or promised. In the everyday world, we use this word. We, we talk about um, hoping for a, a raise or hoping we get the promotion we want or hoping that one day I'll get married or hoping that our team gets to the Super Bowl. Lions fans, give it up. But that's what we're hoping for, hoping some of us without hope. Sadly to say, though, that for many of us, hope lacks a sense of certainty. It's really more like a wish, something we want to happen, but we don't have any real way of knowing that ultimately it will happen. So we keep our fingers crossed and we hope everything will work out the way we want it to work out. The reality for too many of us is that life doesn't turn out the way we hoped it would. Hope is what we call a fragile commodity, an easily broken product. When life is disappointing, our optimism, our excitement is replaced with feelings of discouragement and hopelessness. Before, before long, we run the risk of becoming a cynic who believes that there is really nothing in which I can confidently hope. Well, this, when we look at our text today, this is where those people were. This was the landscape of life when Jesus came into the world. The prevailing mood of Israel was anything but hope. Maybe it was just a mislaid hope. The once proud nation, the people of Israel were a proud people and now they found themselves in a puppet state uh, of, the, of, of the Roman Empire. They did what the Romans said you had to do. They had to make the Roman government happy. If the Roman government wasn't happy, nobody was happy. So this is where they were. The common person lived under the defeating burden of the exaggerated requirements of the religious establishments. That's the, the law or the mislaid hope that I was talking about. Because they found themselves under the Jewish law, which, you know, it was so many laws that they had to keep. It was, you know, you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that, you had to do this on this day. If you did this on this day, you were wrong. If you messed up, if you looked wrong, you couldn't do this. If you were a woman, you really couldn't do nothing. And so all of this was what they found themselves under at this time. Centuries before, way before, most of them, you know, well, none of them were born, way back when it was prophesied or promised that a deliverer was going to come. That was the scripture that I, that I spoke to you from Isaiah. It was said long before that there would be a, a, a savior who was going to come, a, a rescuer who was going to come. But because it hadn't happened and it had been several hundred years, hope was gone. People said, that, that's just something they read to us out of a book. That was, you know, that's just something that they talked about. It, it, it wasn't for us. It was, maybe it was for somebody else. Maybe we missed it. But they didn't see it. It was into this sense of cynical hopelessness, this pessimism 
that true hope was born. The angels were out in the fields. You know the story. If you've been around the church, they were out in the fields. They were abiding in the fields. And all of a sudden, this bright light shone from heaven. And the angels came. And they were announcing the birth of the Savior. Jesus. True hope. But the tragedy of that very first Christmas when Jesus came was that few people realized that hope had been introduced. It was a very few that were around to hear it. Hope for the forgiveness of sin and hope for a bright future forever. Hope for God's presence and power in our daily living. Hope that would enable us to forget the past and set our sights on stuff that doesn't disappoint. A hope that because of Jesus is a certainty and not just another wish to be dashed on the rocks of reality. When Jesus was born, God made it clear that this baby was the one for whom the world had been waiting and watching and hoping for. Ever since the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, had been driven out of the garden, he was a savior, a deliverer, a king. That's who he was. And so I, I just imagine when, when Mary and Joseph were there in, in, the, in the, the barn, the stable, and they're looking down on their firstborn son. I can imagine, you know, th th what their hearts must have thought when they looked down at this, this little baby, this, this tiny little baby wrapped in, in a blanket. He was just, he was just in, a, in, a, in a, you know, we like to make it cute and pretty, but he was laying in a trough where they fed the animals. It wasn't the cute little stables that we try to put together when we, make it, when we do our little nativity scenes or when we have our little Christmas pageants. It was, if you, you know, my, my grandfather was a farmer, and he had a barn, but nothing cute about his barn. Wasn't cute, didn't smell good, and what, what we would call the manger was some raggedy boxes that basically my grandfather nailed together and put the feed in for the animals. That box that Jesus in. And so I can just imagine, you know, as his parents, they, they're, they're looking at him and, and, and they're surrounded by the animals in the barn. And it's like, wow, wonder what were they thinking? Did they realize that this was no ordinary baby? No, 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 he wasn't. This, this was the one in whom God's promises would be fulfilled through him. Did they know that he was the one to whom God's people would find forgiveness of their sins? In one in whom they would find true and lasting peace. It would, could they realize, I mean, was that overwhelming to them? The one whose power would establish an eternal kingdom? The word said his kingdom shall never end. He shall rule forever. A kingdom of justice and righteousness. It must have been overwhelming as they considered the awesome responsibility that they held in their arms, that they looked down to see. Wow. As we look today at the candle of hope, we're reminded, just as Mary and Joseph, that Jesus came as the light of hope into a very dark world. He was and is hope in the flesh. He wasn't just a dream. He wasn't a wish. He was real, just as he is today. He's hope for those in darkness. You heard as the, as the ladies read today, folks who are struggling, folks who've been cast aside, folks who've been kicked to the curb, folks who are, who are outcasts in society. He was, those, he was the hope to those folks, those folks who were lost, who thought they had no hope. He was hope for those who have seen the light. You know, some of us, we've seen the light, but because life has gotten disappointing, because life hasn't turned out the way we thought it would turn out, even though we were, you know, we're believers. We talked about that last week about how even though I'm a believer, sometimes I'm going to have struggles. I'm going to go through some things. Everything is not going to work just exactly the way I planned it out. You know, some of us when we were young, you know, being a woman, you're young, you talk to your, your friends about, you know, when I get married, what it's going to be like, you know, I'm a, it's going to be, you're going to be married, you're going to have the two kids, you had a white picket fence, and you have the station wagon, so you can put them in there, you know, the guys, what, I don't know what the guys were dreaming about as kids. But we all had these dreams, we all had these hopes, we all had these thoughts about how life would be. And then when I got grown, Lord have mercy, reality came. And if we be honest, it wasn't real close to the dream that we had set up when we were coming up. And some of us, because we got, you know, we, we got some teaching that was not biblically correct, 
Some of us thought, you know, once I give my heart to Jesus, everything's going to be great. Everything I thought I want is going to be mine. And then we got saved, became a believer, a follower of Christ, and we've been walking the walk. And it's like, Lord, I love you. You've been good to me. But if I be honest, God, there's some things that have not been quite the way I thought they would be. I'm not necessarily in the place I thought I would be in, or I didn't get to the place the way I thought I would get to the place. But these are the folks I'm talking about, people who have seen the light, people who know Jesus Christ, but because of some of life's dismal situations and circumstances, we needed a refreshing in our hope. And that's who Jesus is. He's like a breath of fresh air. He, he came to show us that, you know, life doesn't have to be depressing and dark and broken and I don't have to walk around as folks who have no hope. Jesus represents God's gift of hope to the world, to his people. And just as he was there for them then, I have come to tell you today that he's here for us today. Hope didn't die. It did not. So what we learn from our text today is that God sent us the gift of hope in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. He brought hope to any and everyone who would receive him. Hope that life does not have to be dark and dismal. Hope that I can rise up from my current difficult situation. Hope for a better life, better relationships, better job, and whatever else I might be hoping for. We also learn, and this is the lesson that I'm going to take time to talk about in more detail. We learn that things don't always come in the moment I want them. So just three things I want to share with you. Because things don't always come when I want it. Number one, I may have to wait. Mm -hmm. Wait. Wait. Oh, Pastor, please don't start talking about that again. Wait. Haven't I waited long enough? Haven't I, I, I've just, you know, it's like, God, when you coming? My watch says you off, God. My watch says you should have been here years ago, God. I, I, what am I supposed to do? What, what, what am I supposed to do, God? Well, I want to talk to you about a different kind of waiting. See, I think our waiting has been off. How we wait has been off. Let's look at what, how Simeon waited. In, in verse 25 of that chapter, it said, At that time there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come. He was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come. And then if you look at verse 38, when we talk about Anna, 38, the second part, it says, she talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. When we are waiting in our state of hope, you know, we, we, we waiting, we want it to come, we want to see it, we want it to, to be, we need to look, the, the waiting that, the, the way we wait is that we look forward with an excitement. You know how kids look forward to Christmas morning? Hello? I told you, I'm a kid at heart. I still look forward to Christmas morning. I'm going to just be honest with you. Because I love the excitement. I love being with the family. I love laughing and talking together. We get up on Christmas morning and my siblings come because they all still come because my mom is there and they're all at my house. Some of them spend the night. And we get up that morning, we get up and we talk about the Lord and we have prayer together. And then I said, now let's get to the business right here. That's me. Kid, my, my younger brother and I, we were, we, we were together, and I remember at our house, we could not, you know, get up and go to the tree and open any gifts. We had to get up and make up our bed. We had to eat, all that stuff, which was, to me, a waste of time, but that was the rules of the parents. That's what you did. And so I remember one Christmas, we, we laid up and talking and stuff, and so we got up, and we made our beds, and we made our way into the living room, and my dad came out, and he looked at us. He said, what, what y'all doing? And we were like, well, we woke up and we, we made our beds and we, you know, we got ready. We still had our pajamas, but we had made our beds and we were ready. He looked, he said, it's 2.30 in the morning. Go back in that bed. 
But see, we were looking forward with excitement as to what was going to take place. And when we're talking about waiting for God to move, waiting for this hope, we have to look forward to it with an excitement. We don't look forward. We don't, we don't, we don't sit there and wait in disgust. We don't wait. We, you know, we're upset. We don't wait pouting. We don't sit down. You know how we do. Well, God, you didn't come. come God then I, I then I'll get excited that's not the waiting with expectancy that's not the waiting that I'm talking about when we look to to, to to the way that Simeon was waiting it said he was eagerly waiting that's enthusiastic or even a little impatient but impatient with excitement because he knew God had promised him something and he was looking forward to it and he wasn't about to be turned away he wasn't about to give it up he wasn't about to let it go it's like God you promised me you told me it's coming and Lord whoop, I, just, I can't even be be still because I'm so excited. I can't hardly wait. I can just imagine him because see, when God made him this promise, it wasn't necessarily that day. He had promised him this before that time. When it says that day, that just meant on that day, the same day that Mary and Joseph came, he came too. But he was waiting. He had been looking. It's almost like saying, God, I know it's coming. Is it over here, God? Okay, God, maybe it's not right there for me, but Lord, is it over here? Let me see. I got Maybe not. Okay, then God, where you want me to be? Because I'm waiting, God, and I'm not giving it up. And I'm not going to let anybody talk me out of it because I am eagerly waiting. It also says in verse 38 that Anna was talking to anybody who had been expectantly waiting on the child to come, the promise of God to come. It means that it's an anticipation of. It means that it's an assurance of. It means that I'm believing that it's coming. That's the kind of waiting that I'm talking about. I got to wait in a way that, Lord, because you promised it to me and because I know you, God, and because you've never let me down, because you've never broken a promise, because you've never let go of anything that you said would be, then I'm not going to let go either. I'm anticipating it's coming. I'm getting myself ready. See, when I'm anticipating it, that means I'm believing it's coming, and I'm going to go on and start getting prepared for it. You know, I, I don't know about you. Again, I have to go to me, and we're talking about Christmas time. When we would get ready for Christmas, you know, because back in the day when we believed Santa Claus was coming, and even after I knew it wasn't Santa, when I knew Mom and Dad was Santa Claus, I knew I had put in some requests. And I had some things that I was looking for. And I was anticipating it so much so that I could see myself playing with it. I could see myself, you know, putting it together. I, you know, what am I going to do? I, I, one year I wanted a chemistry set. <laughs> and I, I could see myself doing experiments and, and you know, because I had seen it on TV. I had seen the kids on TV and the stuff was bubbling up out of the test tubes and, and they were dissecting and doing stuff. And I could just see myself, shoot, I'm, I know I'm getting this. Thank God that year I did. I was very happy, but that's what I'm talking about. You are so eagerly waiting. You are anticipating it so strongly that you already see it. You already believe it. You already right there. And that's the kind of waiting that God wants us. That, that's how he wants us to wait. Expectantly and eagerly. Amen. Amen? Yes. Y'all come on now. I know y'all had some breakfast and I don't go to sleep. I'm going to have to tell them next time. Y'all just give them orange juice. That's it. Because <laughs> they're getting sleepy on me. Okay, so I might have to wait. Secondly, what I've got to learn to do is hold on. Hold on. Now, if I had put the rest of it up there, I wanted it to fit in that nice little circle so I didn't put it all up there. Hold on till you see it. Hold on till you see it. When we look again at Simeon, Simeon is so excited. He, he's, a, he's a righteous man, and, and he's waiting on God. And it says there in that, as I just read that first part of the text in 25, but he was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him, and he revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. He had let him know, Simeon, the promise is coming. Hope is coming. The blessing is coming. The Savior is coming. The rescue is coming. That which you have been waiting for is coming. And I'm making you a promise, Simeon. You're not going to die until you put your eyes on it. And so Simeon, no matter how 
don't no matter how old, we don't know exactly how old he was. No, it do, that really doesn't matter. What matters is, no matter what was going on in Simeon's life, Simeon basically said, I'm not going nowhere till I see it. And I'm saying to you today, you've got to hold on till you see it. Okay, maybe I didn't put that where you could understand it. <laughs> you got to wait for the promise that God has given you. Now, let me tell you something. You got to make sure that the promise you're holding on to is from God. I told you before, don't put your faith in faith. We understand that we have to live by faith. The Bible says the, the people of God, we walk by faith, not by sight. That's who we are. We are faith walking people, not just faith talking people. We faith walking people. But our faith is not in faith. Who is our faith in? Amen. And so the same thing with my hope, when I'm hoping for something, I can't put my hope in hoping. I have to put my hope in Jesus. That's the only one who can do anything about it. See, in this world today, we talk about hope, but, but the hope that the world's talking about is not the same hope that the Bible is talking about. It is not in, in just anybody. It's not in just anything. My hope, there's a song I love, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's where my hope lies. It lies in Jesus. It lies in the one who will not fail me. It lies in the one who can do any and everything that I need him to do for my life. Amen? Amen. So when I'm hoping, I'm putting my hope in the promises that my God has made to me. The problem with some of us we ain't take time to find out what it is from God. I'm sorry, hello. See, Simeon, let's look at Simeon. See, Simeon's hope was in God. My question to you is, where is yours? When I look at Simeon, right there in the beginning of the text, chapter 25, when it tells us, you know, there was this man named Simeon, but then it describes him. It said he was righteous and devout. He was godly. And he was committed. Help us, Lord. He was godly. He was godly, which means he walked with God. He lived with God. He served God. And he didn't do it just on Sunday morning at 1030. It was a 24-7, 365. It was his life. It wasn't something he did. It was something he lived. And that's the difference in many of us today. We don't know what it means to be righteous because we, we haven't taken the time to learn what it means to be righteous. Righteousness is not found in a book, right, except the word of God. Righteousness is found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That's where it's found. And it, then it said he was devout, which means he was committed. God could count on him. He followed hard after God. God didn't have to go looking for him or, or find, you know, Simeon, what you doing? Well, God right now is watching TV. Simeon, what you doing right now was on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, whatever it is that takes up our time. I'm not saying you should never do those things, but I'm saying those things should not consume you. Your commitment has to be to the things of God. It has to be with God. He didn't say that he was lazy and unrighteous. He told him I'm not looking at anybody. I'm looking up at the 100-year celebration. Too many of us are unrighteous and lazy. I don't want to, see, to be committed, it takes some work. Now, if it's something I want to do, I'll do it. I used to tell the young folks all the time, don't tell me y'all can't learn. Put a video game in your hand. You'll figure it out just as quick. Now, I'm a techie, and I love technical stuff. But I've never been able to figure out games. Maybe because it wasn't my interest, I don't know. But because but the kids, they didn't just play the game. They learn to, uh, what is that you guys do when you, uh, you can get the special points, Derek and Darren and Sherrod, what is that y'all do on the video games? And you can make it jump or get ahead or you get the special points or whatever that is on a video game. The, the secret stuff that you guys learn. Huh? Hack it? Well, they can hack it, yeah. But there's something in the game that you can learn how to do. Yeah, but see, but, but see that, that when you, so don't tell me you can't be committed to God. When it's something that we want to do, we do it. But for some reason, when it comes to the things of God, I'm too busy. I'm too tired. Pastor, you don't know, I, I work seven days. I do all this stuff. Yeah, but just let, let, let the right thing come. Let the football game come on. 
Go Michigan! Let that happen. Everything else gonna take a back seat, right? Ladies, let them say we going shopping at the right store. Whoops! Pastor, I can't get there because we don't, you know, we can ready to have prayer meeting. The Lord passed the out. I worked all day and I'm tired and I just got to go home. And they said, well, we're going shopping just before. I'll be there. Save me a seat. You know, that's a save a seat for me. We'll do that because it's what we want. But see, when I'm talking about holding on till I see it, I got to be committed to it. I got to be a person who lives godly, who follows hard after God. And so I ask you today, what promise do you have from God that you're holding on to? What is it that God has told you is going to come into pass for you? Or he's going to give to you? Or he's going to show you? Or what door is it that you believe that he's going to open for you? And I'm saying to you today, you hold on till you see it. You have the, the commitment of Simeon who said, I'm going to hold on till I see it. And then when, when the baby Jesus was brought to the temple and he was there, he said, I believe it's King James that said, Lord, let your servant depart in peace because I've seen. I see it now, God. I know that you are the God who is the God. I know that you are the one who is true to his word. I know that you are the one who won't let me down. I know that you are the one who, when you make a promise, you are true to your word. He's not like the people in your life today who may be true and may not be true, who make you a promise, and if something come up, well, you know, you know I'm human and I can't do, you know. You understand, don't you? Surely you don't hold it against me, you know. That's not who God is. That's not how he rolls. That's not what he says. If he makes you a promise... You don't have to worry about it anymore. But now, understand that you can't give up before you see it. Because God's time and my time, and we've been talking about this, they're two different things. A day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Our timing is not the same. And I can't hold God to my timing. Because if I trust him, if I believe in him, if I love him, if I'm committed to him, one thing I know is that he knows what's best for me. He knows what's best for my life. He knows when I should have it. He knows what I should have. He knows how to give it to me. That's if I trust him. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have to like his timing. That's okay. But I do need to trust his timing. I can tell him, Lord, I, you know this, I, I thought, you know, again, I thought, Lord, this would be over by now. But then I got to say, but nevertheless, like Jesus said, not my will, but your will, God. So hold on till you see it. And make sure that you're being led by God's spirit. Okay? Not my spirit, not some other spirit, but by God's spirit. Because it says right there, at the end of verse 25, it said the Holy Spirit was upon him. And the Holy Spirit was the one who revealed to him that you're not going to die until you see it. And then it says that day, which now is going to the, day, the, the current day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So he was being led by the Spirit. It was the Spirit of God who had given him the promise. It was the Spirit of God who had put in him that, that, that I'm, I'm going to hold on till I see it. And it was the Spirit of God who basically said to him, today is the day. You're going to see it today. And because he was led by the Spirit, he got to see the promise that God had made to him. I want to interject this as, I, as it, it just comes to my mind. For some of us, we're not seeing it because we're not following the leading of the Holy Spirit. The promise that God has made us, it wasn't God who failed on the promise. It was because I failed to follow him. I got to follow him close. And I can't get discouraged because it didn't come yesterday. If he said it's coming then trust that it's coming. 
and stay close enough to him to hear him, to sense him, to feel him, and to follow him. Amen? Amen. All right, so you got to wait to see it. And then lastly, praise God. Yep, praise God. In verse 28, when Simeon went to the temple, it said he was there, Simeon was there, he took the child in his arms and he praised God. He began to praise him, he began to, to worship him, he began to let him a sovereign God, now let your servant die in peace. As you have promised, I have seen your salvation, which you prepared for your people. He is the light to reveal God to all the nations and he is the glory of your people Israel. He rejoiced in God and what God had done. See, for too many of us, when we receive what it is God has for us, for some reason we don't even take time to say thank you. We don't take time to praise God. It's almost like he owed it to me. I got a sense of entitlement, and he did it. That's good. Thank you, and move up, keep moving along. But we don't take the time to praise God. We will praise everybody else. We'll praise everything else. We'll get excited about all kinds of stuff. But when it comes to God, we got to be people that praise him. And then when we see in verse 38, when Anna as she came up and she was talking, and she heard Mary and Joseph and Simeon talking. It says she began praising God. She began praising God because, again, she had been waiting too. And now she hears, she hears that, that God has delivered on his word, that the hope that they've been waiting for is present. And so now she begins to praise God as well. We can't be ashamed to thank God and to praise God for what he has done, for what he's doing, and even for what he's going to do. I got to be willing to praise him. We, you know, some of us need to ask God, Lord, would you give me the same excitement about Jesus as you give me for my favorite stuff? Would you, would you help me to rejoice in him like I rejoice when my team wins or, or when, when, when the, there's a big sale at Macy's or wherever the sales are and I get all excited and I'm just, woo! <laughs> would you help me, God, to give some excitement to you like that? Because after all, Lord, you are my hope. You are my joy and my peace. You're my strength. You're my salvation. Would you help me, Lord? And, and I know we worship God differently. All of us don't jump up and down in that crazy, you know, that, and I tell you, I don't apologize for that anymore. But, but all of us, that's not who we are and how we are. But, but you let, you know, it, it, it amazes me because we say we don't do that. But again, you let the right thing happen. We can show some excitement. We have a way to do it. We do. And so... I got to praise God, not only because of what he's done for me, but then other people need to hear it too. It said that, in that verse, it said that, that, that Anna talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. There were some other people who were waiting. There were some other folks who needed to hear. There were some other people who had been holding on to. And, and in our lives today, as we experience God and the hope that he brings and the joy that he brings, there's some other folk who are standing on the fringes, who are standing around, who may need to hear the joy, may need to hear the rejoicing, may need to hear us praising God. Because then, you know, when, when that happens, many times, that gives us an opportunity. They say, to you, well, why are you praising? What's going on? What, what's happening? Oh, let me tell you. And I can begin to share my story. You know, we always say, well, Pastor, see, I don't, you know, I don't know how you know, to tell people about Jesus. I'm, I, you know, how do I witness? How do I do that? I, I don't, you know, I don't know the Bible like that. I'm not a preacher. You don't have to be a preacher. Just begin to praise God for what he's doing in your life. Because that will open up a door for you to share him with somebody else. And lastly, when we're talking about praising God, and I said, you know, we praise him because, you know, what he's doing and what he's done. But then when I'm believing God, when I'm trusting God, guess what? And I know we've heard this before. How about I praise God on credit? You know what that means? That means I praise him in anticipation of what he's going to do. You know why? Because I believe, just like I said in the beginning, I'm believing God so strongly. I'm eagerly awaiting it. I'm, I'm believing it so much that I see it, that I'm, be, I'm beginning to feel it. I'm beginning to experience it. So I'm going to just start praising him now for what he's going to do. Because you know what? If you don't remember, God is an eternal God. He doesn't have a yesterday or a tomorrow. He just is today. He's just eternal. If he said it over there, or if he said it, and, and I, it, it's already done. It's already in the atmosphere. I haven't gotten to it yet, but it's already done. But I have to trust him. I have to begin to praise him because I anticipate that it's coming. And I'm so excited about it, and I'm believing God so strongly, and I'm holding on to it till I see it so that I, I'm, so, I'm in the moment already. And so I'm going to just start to praise him in anticipation of. 
because I'm believing him that strong. You ever praise God like that? Few of you have. I heard just, yeah, yeah. People think you're crazy when you do that. I'm going to tell you that up front. They think you're a little strange. They think you're a little fanatical. We got to stop caring what people think. Mm -hmm. Start thinking of caring what God thinks. Because, see, it makes God feel good. Because it shows him, Lord, I trust you. I'm believing in you, God. I'm holding on to it, God, till I see it. But I already, actually, I already see it because I see it with my spiritual eyes, not my physical. It didn't come in the flesh yet, but I see it because of where I am in Christ. So as we're talking about hope today, you expectantly wait for it. You believe God for it. You don't back up from it. You hold on to it till you see it. And you begin to praise God for it, both because of what he already did, because of what he's doing right now, and because of what you anticipate him doing. Amen? Amen. Go ahead and put some music on, guys. As we, again, celebrate hope, I just want somebody to understand that hope has come. His name is Jesus. You may have to help him out, Deb. Wherever you might find yourself today, first of all, let me say to those who don't know Jesus, you may feel like there is no hope anywhere. Because right now in this world, it seems a bit dark. Life does seem hopeless at times, just being honest with you. If you just look at things at face value, you could have a sense of hopelessness. Things seem to be topsy-turvy. And right now it doesn't seem like it's getting any better. Doesn't matter what politician you stand behind. Doesn't matter, you know, who you hold to. It just seems like we're in a mess right now. But I just want to tell you that in Jesus Christ, there is hope. It's not a physical hope that I can grab like I grab this desk. But it is a hope in my heart. It is a hope that lights up the darkness like nothing you've ever experienced. It's a hope that is real. Jesus wants to come in. He wants to have a relationship with you. And I guarantee you with my life that your life will change. And it'll change for the better. And for those of us who have a relationship with Christ, as I said earlier, sometimes because life doesn't go the way we thought it ought to go. Because I had some ideas in my mind or I had some plans in my mind and it didn't come the way I thought it came. Sometimes we find ourselves kind of, we won't, we won't say all hope is lost, but it might be waning a bit. But Jesus says, I'm still here. I'm your hope. I have everything that you need. What I need you to do is wait. Expectantly wait. And while you're waiting, trust me. Trust that I know what I'm doing. Trust me that I know how I'm going to work this thing out. Matter of fact, I've already worked it out. I'm not even trying to. I've done it. You just haven't seen it yet. But I need you to expectantly wait. And I need you to hear from me what it is I'm trying to say to you so you have something to hold on to. And I don't want you to let it go until you see it come to pass. But what you can do is while you're waiting, you can begin to praise me in the waiting time because you anticipate what I'm going to do. I want to pray for us today. 
And if the Lord is speaking to you, I invite you to come. We're just going to come across the front and we're going to pray. Because some of us are struggling. We're in a place that's going on. I'm not sure. But I, I, I want to I wanna hold on to you, God. I'm holding on, God. And I'm determined I'm not going to let go. Because I believe it's coming. And some say, my change is coming. Your will is coming. A new way is coming. Some things I've been praying about, Lord, they're coming. I have, I have the assurance, like Simeon had, that it's coming. And you're not going to die before you see it. And just like the song says, God makes a way. Because he knows exactly what's needed. We think we know. But God knows. And so I want to pray. Sister Kim, you don't have to come forward. You can sit right there. I see you. Amen. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I thank you for what you've done for us, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for how you have blessed us up till this point. You are an awesome, awesome God. A God who never breaks a promise. A God who can be trusted. Lord, we confess to you that we've been let down by a lot of people. Things didn't go like we thought it ought to go, and some days it kind of puts us in a negative space. And some days, God, we, when you don't move the way we thought you should or we don't, you don't move as fast as we thought you should move, we find ourselves beginning to wonder, God. I mean, that's, it's just being honest with you, Dad. But God, I hear you reminding us like you reminded Simeon that I'm sending a Savior, a Rescuer, a redeemer, a healer, a deliverer. And Lord, we know he's already here. But for some of us, God, we have to receive him into our hearts, into our lives. We have to receive him. We have to allow him in to every space of who we are. Because dad, sometimes we confess that some days we compartmentalize things, God, and we we let you in here, but we don't let you over here. We, we talk to you about this, but we don't talk to you about this. As if you don't already know. But God, we need you today. We thank you that hope has come. And his name is Jesus. He is everything we have ever needed him to be. Father, forgive us for when we pushed him away, when we doubted him. We let frustration get in the way. We let life get in the way. We let people get in the way, and we pushed him away. Forgive us. And Lord, help us to open up our hearts today and say, Daddy, I need you. I need everything you have for me. I want to be filled with hope. I want to be like Simeon who waited expectantly for his hope to come. I want to be like those folk that Anna was talking to that said they were waiting expectantly, eagerly for the hope. I want to be again like Simeon who said I'm going to hold on to it. I'm not going to let it go till I see it. Because my father has promised it to me. And because I love him and I know he loves me, I'm believing his word. Help us to believe you over circumstances and situations, God. Help us to believe you over naysayers and foolish talk, God. Help us, Lord, to come before you, to be people who walk upright, who are committed to you, God, who live in a way that we can get a promise from God. And when you 
give it, God. <coughs> Help us hold on to it and not let go till we see it come to pass. And then, Father, help us to be people who praise you, who praise you with our lips, who praise you with our life, who praise you, Lord, in the dark, who praise you in the, in, in the company of others, who praise you when I'm by myself, who praise you no matter where I find myself. Because, God, wherever I am, you are worthy of praise. Help us, Lord. I pray you have your way in us, God. And, Lord, if there are those in our midst or those who listen online, Lord, I'm praying that if they don't know you as Savior, they don't have the hope of the Lord in their lives. I am praying, Lord, that something that was said here today through the power of the Holy Spirit would draw them and they would desire you. And that, Father, you would put some believers in their path who would say, I'm here. God sent me here to walk with you, to show you what a walking godly looks like. And they will be connected up, Lord, first to you and then to your children. And, Father, they would find a place where they could belong and grow. Lord, I just want to thank you. I just want to bless your name for what you've done, for what you're doing, God. I thank you that answers are being sent even as we speak. That people are receiving their promises from God even in this moment, Father. I thank you. I bless your name. I glorify you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give God some praise today.